Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Inside Furman Basketball get-together with uh, Furman head coach Bob Ritchie. Pal is getting set to open SOCOM play uh, this week with a pair of road games tomorrow night at Greensboro and Saturday at Chattanooga. We'll give you broadcast information about both of those a little bit later on. But uh, as normally, we will open it up for questions after head coach Bob Ritchie gives us an opening statement. Bob? All right, I uh, appreciate everybody being here. And uh, we're excited to start off league play and um, obviously got to go on the road to open up. There's two really, really good teams. And, um, you know, the series with both of these teams has, has been, um, you know, one, one uh, you look back on the past couple of years and they've always been good games for the most part. And we expect the same thing going there to Greensboro. Mike Jones does a great job. Those guys always play really, really hard and um, they defend you and they've got a lot of old players. And so um, we've seen these Langley brothers uh, for years, because they five or six years, they've been there a long time and they're really, really good. And, you know, they've got interior presence and, um, you know, Brown Jones, I'm assuming coming back at some point um, and, and, and probably, I mean, I, you, you get the conference play, and, you know, you, you typically see guys start to get healthy and, um, you know, get out there. So. They've got, they've got really good guard play. They've also got good interior presence, and uh, they're very well coached. So uh, excited about the challenge and uh, excited to get to league play. And, uh, you know, this is this is when this thing gets fun. This is a great league, and it's historically uh, been a lot of fun to follow conference play. And, um, you know, you got you got as we saw last year, it's never really about how you necessarily start, but it's about how you continue to improve and how you finish and how you keep getting better. And um, that's what our focus is at this point. Coach, um, from someone who doesn't know anything about basketball other than watching, I, I can tell how well UNCG is coached. Um, what is the number one thing they do that presents a problem uh, from the, from that perspective? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of good things they do. You know, I think um, Mike's teams always play with tremendous energy, and they always play. Um, they always they always defend you. You know, and, and they they really focus on that end of the floor and. You know, they try to be physical. You know, they try to really affect you around the rim. Uh, they try to keep the ball in front. You know, they've got aggressive flow to the ball. And, um, you know, that's that's typically, you know, I mean, they've always been one of the best defensive teams in the league. And uh, But they can also score. You know, they're complete. And, and he gives, I think Mike does a really good job of giving his players confidence and letting those guys go play uh, to their strengths. And so, you know, the, the Langley brothers play with tremendous confidence with the ball in their hand. And um, really, they, they shoot as many dribble threes as, as probably a team that will play, but they do it with extreme confidence. And um, you know, so you, you've got you've got really good perimeter shooting on the arc. You know, Kobe's really, I mean, Kobe's playing well. He's really, really improved. And, and both he and Kayshawn have always been really, really good players. Uh, but man, they're both they're both getting shots from the edges right now. And you got Adler that's shooting as good as anybody in the conference. And so you know, and you, you you couple that with an all conference post player down there. Repertoire of bigs, you know, that can present different problems, and so, you know, they got good players, they got good schemes, they they play with tremendous energy, and um, usually when you have those three things, you know, you have a chance to be really good. Coach, the last uh, four years, split them has been interesting. That uh, UNCG has won here, and you've been able to win in Greensboro. How you been able to do that on the road? Yeah, I think um, I, I think that's interesting. You know, you don't see that too often. They, they've seen that our number at home and. You know, we've been able to get some wins up there. And, um, you know, I think I think it's one of those games you go back and look at it, um, you know, here last year and up there, uh, the team that played, you know, with the most energy and defended the best won the game. And, um, you know, I think that two years ago, man, up there was just an absolute, two years ago, both games just came down to basically the last, the last couple minutes. And, um, you know, they beat us at the well. Um, you know, they, they Garrett made that shot to go up and then we had a defensive rebound and we lost it and then we fouled and they ended up making the play down the stretch. And then up there, it was kind of the same thing, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I think Alex Hunter made that hand one three to give us a little bit of separation there. But, you know, it was, it was, it could have gone either way. And um, I think when you, when you play teams at the, at the top of the league and, and you got guys that are experienced and you got guys that really compete and you got good schemes and good coaching, you know, that's usually what happens in league, in league games. They're going to come down to the very end, and um, you got to have you got to have the mental toughness to be able to generate.
base stops and, and really to be able to play live duty the best you can. And uh, that's what we're going to try to do tomorrow night. Um, obviously, there are exceptions, and there have been, but a recurring theme of this year has been having a rough night with three pointers at the same time that the team was hitting 60% or more inside the arc. Now, I know it's part of the game. Do you, I, and you don't want to give up on that, but do you stick with that or do you start to adjust your offense based on the sample to date? Yeah, I'm trying to track where you're so, are, are you suggesting shoot less threes and shoot no, more I'm, twos? No, I'm saying how do you analyze that and where you go from here? Well, I don't think it's consistent. You know, I mean, do we make shots for Spelman? Do we make shots for Tulane? Yeah. I mean, I get it. Yeah, we've had we've had probably three nights where it's been really poor from out there. Um, we got good shooters, and you know, we had two really good shooters in, in suits, right? So like, no, we're not gonna. I mean, for for seven years now, we've averaged basically eight points a game, and. Um, you know, our, our issue on Saturday was not offense. You know, we gave up 79 points. And so we missed 14 free throws. You know what I mean? Like, that that's a way bigger issue. You score 74 in a game, and you go back and look at it, and you're like, man, we turned this thing over 16 times, and we missed 14 free throws, and we went two for 20 from three. Well, if we take care of the ball a little bit more, and we shoot an average number from the free throw line, throw in, let's say we go four for 20 from three, okay, which is still a pretty poor night. Now all of a sudden you're scoring 90 plus. You know, nobody's worried about it, you know, but obviously the outcome was was poor and um, our effort was embarrassing at best on the defensive end of the floor and, and we lacked we lacked leadership on the court to play the values. And, um, and, and look, no excuses, these are just truths. We had 40 points on the bench. You know, and, and I'm going to protect my guys. You know, I think all coaches would love to play a team and pull 40 points right off the, right off the court. And, and even with that, we should have played harder and we should have played tougher. But on that particular day, we woke up and we thought winning was going to be easy. And when you decide that winning is going to be easy, right, and you drop your standard at all, and you play a team that is basically their Super Bowl and their, their biggest game of the year, okay, and they, and they they traveled more fans here than you know had at some of their home games this year. Then you put yourself in a position where you're not ready to play and you think winning's gonna be easy, and then that's what happens. And I don't think it, my personal opinion, I don't think it had anything to do with if we had made more threes, right? I think it had to do more if we would have had the correct mentality to just play the game the way the game's supposed to be played and lead how, we, how we're supposed to lead on the floor to our values. I think we would have been just fine. And, um, you know, I will say this, I've been really proud of our team's response in the last 48 hours. And, um, you know, I've been really, really, really pleased with J.P. Pagese's leadership. And, you know, he started communicating with me Saturday night late uh, that he wanted to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. And um, we met for an hour on Sunday morning. And it's as good of a meeting in terms of the words that he could have said in that moment of what needs to be done and what he observed and the things that he's got to do better as a leader things that he wants to do better as a leader. And when you get players communicating that on their own and they're, they're making those decisions on their own convictions, that's, that's, that's when this stuff really starts to show progress. And I think it was much more of a, a, a absence of leadership on that court because when you lack leadership on the court, there's no way you can carry any type of accountability out there, which now without accountability, you have no standard of performance, right? It's not great teammate fly around on D, move and bag the ball, because there's no accountability to it. And then all of a sudden entitlement starts to creep in that, hey, we're supposed to win. And then all of a sudden you don't have that mindset that we have to go earn victory. Well, now all of a sudden you're putting yourself, anybody can beat you, right? Like they're, they're not a team on your schedule that can't beat you if you go into it with that mentality. And so, you know, I, I hear your question and I'm not saying your observation was incorrect, um, but I think we have really, really good shooters on this team. I think once we have the right mentality, you know, we've had games this year where we've shot the ball really well. And, and I think it's it's all about can we find consistency in our leadership? Can we find consistency in playing to our values? Can we can find consistency of how we prepare mentally for games? I think that's going to be the trick for this team. Um, Coach, 
which if you look at UNCG um, when, when they were under Wes Miller as opposed to now, they've always been good, really, really good on the defensive end of the floor, but they've really evolved, I think, offensively to become a team that can put pressure, more pressure on you on that end of the floor now. What, I mean, I guess, Scott kind of already alluded to it, but like, are they playing at a faster pace or how are they being more efficient seemingly under Mike Jones right now than I can remember them being under Coach Miller? Um, man, I'll tell you this, that's a hard question to answer. I got a ton of respect for Wes and Mike. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I think Wes ran some good stuff. I mean, I think, I think Isaiah Miller posted up some bonds some good offensive players. Um, you know, to be honest with you, it's funny when you watch them on film, there, there are definitely some differences. I feel like every time we play Greensboro, it's like middle of the floor ball screens, you know, whether it was Dickie running out there and, and, um, and setting them, and then you got you got some type of pin action. I mean, for years, we were chasing Alonzo, you know, now we're chasing Adel, you know, and we're chasing some of the Langleys. And, you know, it's, it's um, there's definitely some differences. I, I think the biggest thing, you know, Wes, Wes Miller's a, a phenomenal coach. Mike Jones is a phenomenal coach. You got a program that's won consistently for a while now. That's been the two NCAA tournaments in the last ten years, and they have a they have an identity, right? Like this is who we are. This is like we 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 know how we have to play and we know how we have to win. And um, you know, I think offensively, like I said, you know, you're talking about you're talking about some guys that have some power power from the edges that can really shoot. I mean, these guys are shooting a lot of threes. Like you look at their numbers and they're getting the ball up from, from the outside. And um, and so, you know, that, that that might be one observation is maybe, you know, they they've they've trended a little bit more to a higher volume of three pointers. But you know what? Like that's also a common trend in college basketball right now in general. And and I think, you know, they've got the personnel to be able to do it. And um, you know, if you've got good shooters, hey, let them fly. That was probably one of my biggest takeaways from the other night. Not, not so much that we only made two, that we only got up 20. You know, like you got to play this game with confidence. You got to play this game with belief. And um, you got to go out there and you got to step into them and hit them. And I will say with this team in Greensboro, like, you know, they've got some guys that are really confident. And like I said, off the catch, but also the deep part that we got to do a really good job on. We did a poor job of that last year here. Uh, we let Langley get off the dribble. And I think, I think we hit three threes off the dribble in that game. Coach, I know that on Saturday, you know, you was down two of your best players, but you had, was able to get your bench to get some more. Who, who on the bench uh, gave you the best effort this past weekend that you would look at and say, that's what we're going to need down the stretch in, in conference play? You know, I thought um, I thought more so second half. I thought Tyrese Hughes really helped us. I think um, I thought, you know, they started really having some aggressive mm -hmm. goals for the rim. Did, did job getting some rebounds, did some good job getting his free throws, and, you know, really putting some pressure on the on the rim with his rolling. And um, you know, Tyrese is somebody I've always had a tremendous amount of belief in. You know, I think that Tyrese is one of those players, he can really do everything on the court that you need him to do. He just has to believe it. I mean he's got a play with an intensity and and, and a fire about him that's consistent. And um, you know, yesterday we obviously had a pretty spirited practice fun to watch. Garrett had the best practice he had all year, which was, which was great because I, I, didn't, I didn't think he was ready to play on Saturday. It was great to see his response. Um, but then Tyrese had a, had a really, really good practice as well. And, and those two guys are playing with the physicality the game demands and they're getting on the backboards and they're making the tough physical plays. You know, we're, we're a different team. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where we, we need Tyrese to step up. Gives us, he gives us some different options in terms of, you know, you're talking about a 40% three-point shooter, you know, but also he's a guy that can roll and finish over the, over the rim. And so he's got a unique ability to put pressure on the rim but also be able to step out from the edges. And, and that gives you some optionality in your offense that, that I think we need. He can chase down balls. I mean, yesterday we couldn't keep him off the offensive glass. Well, that's a choice. You know, I mean, he only got one on Saturday, you know, and that one tied the game up. 
he should have given us the momentum we needed to finish the game. But, you know, it's one of those situations where we need more just not ability and not points and not talent per se. We need more edge and energy from him because he's got the ability to give that to us. And, you know, I've always thought through this team, we're always trying to figure out an upside, right? Like what's our best team in March? And I've always thought he's a he's a he's a part of that. You know, he's he's a very key piece in that. And um, you know, I think we've got to continue to help him get there. But I think at the same time, uh, he's somebody that 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 is if if he does get there, then that changes what we can do, and that changes some of our ability as a team. Bob, you addressed leadership just a moment ago. You addressed it on the post game radio uh, after Anderson, and. Obviously, from last year, you lost two really good leaders, not just two outstanding fifth-year players, but two really good leaders. Leadership is not something that just happens. It's part of the developmental process. How do you, as a coach, how do you as a staff develop leaders, especially when guys are being asked maybe to be in that role for the first time? Yeah, uh, great question, Dan. You know, it's, um, listen, when, when, I, when I say things about our leadership, just understand, first of all, pointing at myself first. And I've done a, a, a job that hasn't quite been good enough to get that player that leadership, and ultimately that's my job. And one, one of the, I, I hate to use the word luxuries, but you know, when you're going through hard times, you don't always realize the dividend and the payoff it's gonna give you until you get on the other side of it. But, you know, I've told you all this before, as an assistant for 11 seasons, I was part of nine losing seasons. So I saw a lot of losing, and I saw a lot of trending up of two programs that we had to build, and there was a trend that went up. But it, both both at Charleston Southern, and when I got to Furman, I mean, it was it was single, single digit wins, but we had to just find the building blocks and figure out the identity and figure out how to win in both places. And what I realized early in my career is, the easiest thing for a coach to do is blame the player leadership for the lack of success. And I always think when leadership on the court is questioned, that's an indictment on me first. And my job and what, I, what I've done when I got the job here, creating the Further Demand Program, creating the Leadership Council, has been to have a mechanism in place to develop leaders and to develop people. Because I think that as we do that, then that allows you to have sustainable success, right? Can you continue the leadership that's gotten us to where we have gotten to. I think one thing we also have to know with leadership is it's incredibly hard, right? It's incredibly difficult, okay? Um, everybody wants to lead when you're winning. Everybody wants to lead when things are going well. Those are really easy things to do. Leaders are made in adversity, right? Leaders are developed in hard times. That's, that's when they stand out the most. That's when people start to get behind their conviction and their courage and their confidence because they're willing to endure the storm. And I think what I have to do is continue to help these guys. I love this group. I mean, I love our, I love the people that we have. I love the players that we have. Um, we, we chose a very challenging schedule. We didn't know that we were gonna go through the type of injuries that we've had to go through. We didn't know that we we're gonna be without Marcus for a while. And, you know, heck, I mean, it just yesterday, Carter couldn't practice. Today, we had another one that couldn't practice. You know, like, fortunately, JP did practice. You know, and like, you just kind of like, it seems like every day, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with our trainer, you know? Well, that can be a, a, a negative, or you can just lead through that, and you can teach your team how to respond to that. And you've got to get your players to be willing to do it. But then once you're able to do that, then now all of a sudden you can navigate the hard times together. And, um, you know, typically around here, when we have a tough day or a game that doesn't, doesn't go our way, um, I like to just go over the alley, you know, and just kind of have a, tight gym, closed, tight practice, and um, you know, kind of a road mentality. You can smell the polyurethane from a mile away. <laughs> you just get in there and, and you just you just you just you just work it out. And um, I was going over there yesterday and I text Mike and Slaw and I said, we're heading over the alley. And um, you know, they, they remember those days. We had a couple of those days last year, right? And it's one of those days where you you the first thing you have to do, Dan, is you have to teach your players how to respond. Right? And you can't just go over there and just expect them to figure it out, okay? Um, I met with Garrett Saturday night after the game, okay? I met with JP Sunday morning for an hour. I met with two other players that afternoon. I was up here all day on Sunday, you know, 
basically a lot of the day um, meeting with our players one on one, right? To, to continue to pursue their hearts, continue to try to help them. Hey, this is how we have to respond. Show them, teach them. They got to be willing, and then once they're willing, and you can work, we can work in that together. It's not going to be perfect. I can't expect it to be perfect, but it's going to be a step in the right direction. And and I think that that's what gives me the most excitement is is we have guys that can lead, but man, like we did lose two good ones. And um, not only that, okay, not only that, but they've also had to endure a little bit more than even those guys last year had to. You know, I mean, we had a relatively a very healthy season last year. Uh, I think our strength of schedule was in, in the you know 88 range for a while this year. Last year it was in the mid 200s. You know, so like this group has had to endure more, which means I need to help them more. Um, and I've allowed a few things that that probably have maybe in some ways I think it's the natural limb of human nature. You know that that a little entitlement's probably crept in. You know, like like we're Furman and you know we're we're gonna be we're gonna be okay in this particular game or we're gonna be good here. And, you got to earn victory every single day, and and that's a part that's a part of leadership. And um, you know, I enjoy that part of it. I think that it's hard. You know, it's it's not like I'm human too. You know, and I'm, I'm coaching eighteen to twenty two year olds. Um, it's not like I mean, it's not like you just say, oh yeah, let's 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 take all the adversity we can get, and you know, we love all this. But that's the mentality you have to build, right? Like as we talked about on the other side of it, right, in March last year, what sounds good when, when you're over there cutting down nets to say, oh, count it all joy in hindsight, okay? But like, can you actually do that in a moment? You know, like that's, that can you actually let this develop you? And when it says, when we talk about count it all joy, that it creates long suffering, right? That you have to have the ability to endure. Well, that's leadership. Like, are we gonna tap out, right? Like, hey, we're well attended today. Everybody wants to see, like, is he doom and gloom? You know, is, is he excited? Like, how, how is he? Are those guys okay, right? Like, everybody's texting me, man, you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. You know, like, this is for such a time as this. Like, we got to rise up and lead. And the story's not written, right? Like, like I love all y'all in here to death. Like, whatever y'all type today and whatever y'all write and whatever y'all want to type about this team and whatever y'all are, y'all don't know either. And I say that respectfully. The the people that cover the league, they don't know either, right? Like, it's all, it's all predictions. It's all, like, Man, how's Furman doing? Okay, this thing's gonna get settled in Nashville. That's what that's what happened last year. That's what happened the year before. That's what happened the year before. That's what happened the year before. We've got to continue to stay encouraged. We've got to stay focused on a vision that's greater than our discouragements and greater than our disappointments. And when you go through life, if you lack vision and you lack values, when the disappointment hits you it derails you to where it decreases your focus because you don't have a fixation on a vision and you don't have a fixation on values. And if you can get your eyes fixated on the vision of values of where we're heading and you can just endure, then you're gonna face disappointments and you're gonna face setbacks, but you're gonna be able to see that, hey, those didn't, we didn't, we didn't fall suit to that. We were able to overcome that and utilize that to get to our best version. And that's what we're gonna do here. And, um, you know, hey, Sunday, like long day, you know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm first in, last out, right? And we're, we're, we're working. And yesterday, like we're in here. You know, I got home, you know, I didn't get to see much of the Alabama Michigan game. I heard it was a good one, you know? Like I did get to see a little bit of the ending of the Washington, Texas game. That quarterback was, I mean, that's, that was a show, but you know, we have to work through this. And I think that's where, that's where teams are built. And I think the story on this team, we're in early chapters. Right? We're in early chapters and people want they, they want to close the book on us. That's fine. Okay, like that's okay. I mean, I, I don't think anybody in the basketball world is doing that. They know they know that we have some people that are really, really good that aren't playing. And um, we're gonna be there as long as we continue to develop that leadership. And hopefully I know that was lengthy, but hopefully you hear what I'm saying. Like ultimately that's my responsibility. And 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 I know that we have capable leaders, just like I told y'all two weeks ago. And I'm really, really proud of the way JP has handled this. And uh, it's only gonna elevate his, not just his performance, but man, his, his, his trajectory changes, not just in basketball, but in life, if he continues to embrace and develop the gifts that God's given him to be the natural leader he can be.
Coach, I was on the road and I didn't be here Saturday, but uh, man, thanks to Coach Informer. Now, as I was listening to the, the rebounding by Anderson, one thing I couldn't help but think about was, in addition to his leadership and his scoring, JP's been such a, I think, a difference maker in the rebounding this year too. Uh, kind of, you know, as he's had to do more different things in some, in some instances when people have tried to take him away, he's made a difference in different ways. Um, I think he missed his rebounding as well on Saturday. And just kind of an update on him, uh, injury-wise and others as well. Yeah, I mean, the rebounding, you know, 19 offensive rebounds. I told the team, like, four things went wrong in that game. Okay, really five. The intangible stuff that we've already discussed, we weren't ready to play. Okay, and, and that was very clear. Okay, we thought winning was going to be easy. We didn't show up, and ultimately that's my fault. So the intangible piece, that's, that's one thing that wasn't correct. They could sense that. Okay, we're up nine to two to start the game. We have four scouting report errors in that span of a nine to two game. Okay, we're up seven to start. We, we have four scouting report screw ups. We work through all that. We're up 31 24. They're playing harder than we are. And it's been like that. Okay, they make a couple shots. We let a guy that was supposed to be chasing get two threes off. They have a play right before halftime, about three minutes to go. We're up two. The best shooter misses a three. Their point guard chases it down. We miss the box out on the perimeter. Ball's going out of bounds. He jumps in there. He jumps in the bleachers. He saves it. He throws it back to the best shooter who has the confidence to take another one, okay, playing with house money. And they make it, and they take the lead, but they call a timeout. And at that point, that's when they had their hope. And so what you see there is, the beginning of the game, they weren't getting those offensive rebounds, okay? The offensive rebounds accumulated as their hope grew and as our lack of leadership and our communication and our, our, our void of it, as we got discouraged, okay, then we quit, we quit boxing and we quit crashing. Now, as the game got desperate late, all of a sudden you see we got guys flying in there and getting some offensive rebounds. But then they had hope, and then they got they got boards. The game went on, and obviously they got some critical ones late. Um, but look, hopefully we know that. And, and to be honest with you, Scott, the crazy part of it is, out of our seven teams, this has probably been analytically so far our best rebounding team to date. You know, which 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 goes to show again, like, and look, business major, they they made you take some statistics, you know, just to show you knew a little bit about math. Um, bell curve like it's real you know and, and I think I think in our rebounding it's an outlier game I do um, I'm not going to sit there and all of a sudden tell our guys that hey we, we, we're, we're not when you look at the numbers we're, we're a really good rebounding team but on that particular day we weren't mentally ready to go fight in the way that we needed to and, and I agree I mean listen we know if JP would have been on that court we got a different game on our hands and, and Jimmy knows that too they're not picking up JP for these four courts I mean, let's be serious, okay? Um, the leadership that he gives us, the intangibles that he gives us, the leadership that he gives us, just the edge that he gives us, you know, that's that's what we're missing the most. And we're going to learn from it. You know, we're going to grow from it. In terms of the injury front, um, JP's practiced the last couple of days, which has been great. And um, he's set to play tomorrow night, which we're excited about. I think Marcus, Marcus had a very encouraging appointment on Saturday. Again, all those appointments are trending in the right direction don't really have a timeline on him in terms of, hey, this is the exact date, this is the exact game. Um, you know, we, we could see maybe still a mid-January timeline and, and exactly when that looks like, you know, we'll just have to find out from there. Um, we had, you know, we had three with the flu. I think we're, we have a fourth with the flu that, that's not gonna be able to travel. Um, it's been crazy, you know, and it's been wild, but um, hopefully we're, we're gonna get on the other side of this thing we had, you know, Carter couldn't practice yesterday. He was back today. And then we have another one that couldn't practice today. Hopefully he gets to play tomorrow. It's been a, a lot of things that have just been like, you know, besides Marcus, nothing to this point, knock on wood, has been like long gone, but it's just daily disruptions to where, I mean, I found out yesterday, 30 minutes before practice that, hey, you know, we don't have this one. And then we find out this morning, an hour before practice, hey, we don't have this one. And again, we just have to navigate it. And um, we can't 
flinch, you know, we can't, we can't hesitate. We got to keep fighting and we got to keep swinging. And um, as we start to get healthy and we get these guys back, I'm really excited about where this team can be as this leadership continues to grow and we continue to play to our values. Coach, uh, it's a tough non-conference schedule, tough loss at Princeton, at Tulane, and Anderson, you probably touched on this a moment ago, but how has your team been able to keep, and you as a coaching staff, and even keel and not let one loss turn into another, into another? Yeah, I think that's the key to this, Tom. Like, we, we've got to, we've got to move ahead. You know, everything's about to, it's got to be about what's next. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where there's nothing that we're going to be able to change about any of those outcomes, right? Like, we all know in this room that you could say, well, we, we could be or should be nine and four. You know, hey, none of that matters. You know, like, we don't like where we are, right? I think Bobby Knight's, Bobby Knight's line was like, you are what your record is. And that's what we are. Like, we don't need to, we don't need to talk about how it happened or, you know, man, this one could have gone different. Like, this is what it is. And the more we just acknowledge that, accept it, embrace it, and not fight it and, and not dismiss it, but tackle the things that we are clear that we need to improve on, then at that point, you can utilize what you've been through to use it as a point to help you get better. And I think the more you dismiss it as like, hey, bad luck, or, you know, man, I can't believe Princeton made that shot at the buzzer, or man, Tulane, what a flood call on the day. Like, now all of a sudden, like, that can also prove some entitlement, right? Like, well, we should have won that. No, we shouldn't. Like, we didn't. You know, like, two years ago, the shot went in. Like, you're getting all these texts, you deserve to win. No, we didn't. We deserve to win for 44 minutes and 56 seconds. That's the reality of it. So the quicker we accept that, the faster we can move on and start to utilize this in a manner that helps us better. And that's just where my focus is at, you know. And, and um, you know, I'll tell you this, Tom, like, we went and beat Villanova my second year. And it was a lot of fun. And that's a program that I've studied. And Jay Wright, he's a top five in my book. You know, I mean, he's, he just is, I watched him forever. And a lot of the way um, that we run program and values that we play with, you know, is for me studying those guys. They had just won a national championship the year before. That was their that was their pinnacle moment, right? They won two of them in a short stretch. And it's a little bit like, hey, last year, we had a pinnacle moment, right? Their second win in tournament history, right? Well, we go to Villanova and we beat them. And it was it was right after they won the national championship. And it's like, well, who's Furman? You know, I still got the article in my office. Little, little old Furman, right? Goes up and beats Villanova. Well, if I remember correctly, I, they, I don't think they canceled the season. You know, I don't think they just said, oh, well, you know, we're not. They won the Big East that year, right? Like, it wasn't even like they had an average year. They won the Big East. They went to the tournament. They won the Big East tournament. They, they won, they, I think they made it to the second round in the CLA tournament that, she, that year. And um, they didn't just cave in and say, oh, man, you know, bad luck. Michigan beats us by 30, and then little old Furman comes back and beats us. They figured out, like, hey, what is this exposing and what do we have to get better at? And let's just stay the course and let's go do that. And, and I think, you know, last year, right, Sanford lost to a 9-1. They lost to South Carolina State, right? Well, I think they won 15 games in the league and got to share a regular season and had a really, really good year. And I think they started out 8-0 in the league. You know, they didn't just pack it in. And, and I think that sometimes we get lost in the moment, like, oh, you know, what's going on? And, man, how, look, we're, we're – it is is December going to be looked at as a hey, disappointing December? Yeah, you can look at it that way. You know, you can you can roll with that narrative and you can let that affect your energy and your focus. Or hey, you know, at the end of the day, like, don't matter December. Like, we got to go. We got to move forward. Like, we got we got to take it. We got to utilize it in the best way we can. And we got to we got to keep moving forward to get this team the best. And look, that's that's the trick of all of this. And um, you know, as I, as I alluded to a little while ago. It's going to settle itself in Asheville, and we're going to play these next 18 games to figure out what the seeding's going to be in Asheville, and then we're going to go up there, and we're going to figure out where the chips lie. And nobody, our league's had a good start, but nobody in our league's done enough to get an at-large bid at this point, unless somebody goes undefeated, and I don't think that's going to happen. And so it's going to be another year with one bid league, and we've got to be the most hungry team to go out there and continue to get healthy, continue to get playing to our values, continue to get our leadership where it needs to be so that we can be our best when our best is required. There's a there's a largely discredited view 
that people laugh if you say it now, but it, it's an idealistic view that sports is a microcosm of life, and I actually believe it's true because you can see how culture and everything else changes through sports. And I feel like I have an exalted view of the young because the people that I see and deal with are the very best. And another thing that I have seen is that while when you're talking about, it would have been unthinkable at one time for a player to opt out of a bowl game from my own meager background, I would never, I don't see how a person who's a member of a team with that togetherness can, can do that. So it seems to me that championship teams aren't any different than they always were. And I think that's something that you try to do. But I mean, having, having kids with character can once you're competitive physically and all that, having smart kids with character winds up being a heck of an advantage. And that's probably why the team you're coaching is going to overcome this adversity. But it seems like it's a process that you go through every year and maybe all of us do. Yeah, I think every every championship team, regardless, you know, and, and look, we got no idea what this team's gonna do and, and how we're gonna finish. And, Gonna, we're gonna find all that out in the next, you know, ten weeks or so. Um, but you know, Coach Sweeney's got a line that I've always loved. You know, they don't they don't put rings on clean hands. And you know, I, I believe that. You know, like you got to get calloused and you got to get dirty because the adversity is going to figure out like how how much are you willing to fight for this? You know, like like are you are you gonna continue like we talked about? Like is your is your vision and your values? sudden you get disappointed and it's like oh man I'm not getting out of this what I want to get out of this and I think that's where for us as leaders that's where we have to make sure we continue to focus that hey listen the vision of our program is to not win a single game right the vision of our program is to grow people and in turn grow the program and to sustain a level of winning and development that allows us to continue to compete for championships year after year and as we go through that whole process there's going to be setbacks right but as long as we understand the setbacks don't define us that they could potentially develop us then that's going to, that's where the character piece comes in right you have to be able to convince a room that hey this is worth fighting for and and i think we have that you know and i know we have that i, I was really curious to see how we were going to practice yesterday and it was by far our best practice of the year and you know it's it was not i mean it was not even close i mean it was not even close in terms of our our responses, right? Our player-led voice, our attention to detail, how competitive we were on the defensive end, how we were rebounding, how the ball was moving. Like, though, those are the things over time, we just have to go stack days. And, um, you know, if Mike Jones were sitting here right now and we had a dual press conference, neither of us know what's gonna happen tomorrow night. We know, we know we're gonna have two really good teams with established identities and programs competing and fighting with one another, and we're both gonna try like heck to win the game. He's one of my favorite coaches in the business. Um, but like, you just have to go up there and you've got, you've got to go up there and you've got to play as hard as you can and you've got to continue to get better and you've got to continue, right? When, when you see adversity, the best of the best, the ones that endure in March are the ones that are able to see adversity and not be afraid of it. And last year, man, we all forget this, right? We all, you, you can smile about it all now because we know how the story ends. The night in Charleston in late February was not a lot. Of, it was not a fun night for me or our team or our program, right? And you know, but we weren't afraid of the adversity and we responded to it and we allowed we allowed ourselves to use it to then propel us to go win the next six games, and actually seven games. Uh, yeah, I'm losing count. The next seven games, and um, you know that was a part of the story. But that didn't mean it was easy, and that didn't mean we had we didn't have to overcome it. Um, but we had to use it to develop us. Um, kind of going back on the leadership aspect of everything and maybe a little bit of your meeting yesterday. Um, 
a lot of leadership is you have a you should have most winning teams have a team of leaders they don't just have like one leader i know last year the loss of western carolina um there was i, I think it was jp kind of stepped up and, and said something that kind of motivated the rest of the team um and you i think in that this i think part of a leader is being able to to make it i don't know if the right word is okay to speak up as a younger player when when he sees something that like maybe he thinks can be corrected to an older player how how hard is that for for a, a team leader to say hey man it's okay you know to be humble enough to accept that yeah i think i think you know leadership is um often discussed in sport, it's a little bit like the word culture, like probably the most overused and least understood word out there in our, in our game. And I think a lot of times the definition of leadership can be misconstrued to what players can interpret, what coaches are expecting with that leadership. Like this is what I need you to do. Like I need you to yell at guys. I need you to be screaming at guys. I need you to be, you know, we're, we're, we got we to gotta hold each other more accountable. That's the part of it. Okay, but there's two there's two rails of leadership that have to always be in in equal flow with one another at all times to be the best that you can be, and that's guide. Okay, the guidance and the accountability to standard has to be present at all times. But the other rail to make that train go has to be an inspiration and the belief that we're going to get there. And I think on Saturday when you look at you hear me say lack of leadership, but like does that mean he wanted guys yelling and talking and? and getting on each other. Hey, you know what? Like Saturday, can we have a leader that steps up and inspires a group to a belief that if we just go play the values, we're gonna be okay. Right? Like can you can you stare adversity in the face instead of looking at it like, oh my goodness, is this about to happen? Can you get a group that can inspire one another? Well to be able to do that, you have to have connection, right? You have to have relationship. Okay. You've got to be able to say the things that are gonna motivate that player to go play harder and go do the necessary things to win. And sometimes we get, we, we like get to the edge of like, well, this means we need, listen, our guys, like we need, we need that inspirational component and that belief that, hey, these are the values, this is how we have to do it. And now let's go encourage one another to do it and to ride through the hard together. And I think that's, you know, that's where this team has to continue to grow. You got a guide, you got inspired. You got a guide, you got inspired. You got a guide, you got inspired. And if you get off on either of those two things and it's all inspired, well then now all of a sudden when you have a setback, man, like you don't know what to do, right? But when you're only guiding, well now it can just feel like so heavy, right? It can feel so like there's not a lot of fun in this whole thing, right? And um, you know, if you've read Good and Great, Stockdale Paradox, I mean, it's, it's one of the most basic leadership principles out there, but you have to have an ability to confront the brutal facts, guide, okay? But you have to have an unwavering faith that you can get there, inspire, right? And, and, and those two things can't work in silos. Those two things have to work at the same time with one another. And so my job as a leader, we're gonna confront the brutal facts. Like we're gonna go right at them, okay? Like way too many turnovers, way too many missed box outs, didn't have the mental toughness to go up there and hit free throws when we needed to. Missed, missed 14 free throws, right? Missed a bunch of threes and also didn't take some threes that we should have taken, right? Got to have the mental confidence to go up there and step into those balls and shoot them. We're not leading it the way that we need to. Confront the brutal facts. But hey, y'all might want me to be unwavering right now. Like, my belief in this team has not changed. And I really don't care what anybody says. I, I see it every day. I know what we have. I know what we've been without. I know the things we've been through. I know I know the things that we've had to work through. And you know what? I'm gonna trust that that's just gonna help us to be more enduring and to be a harder, tougher team when it matters most. And we're gonna keep the faith. And we're gonna work our tails off and we're gonna come in there every single day and we're gonna try to figure this thing out. And, and we're gonna do those two things at the same time. And what I've gotta do is continue to convince my team and our players to do the same thing. And that's where the power comes in. And um, you know, go back to moments, you know, that's, this, this is when we need leadership, right? And it's not just that we need to be yelling and getting all negative. We, we 
we got to have a group that has an Omega in it. And, um, and, and, and with that, that we're not pie in the sky anymore and the brutal facts of the things that we got to do to get better. Coach, I think everyone in the room said that they had asked all the questions they had, so I'll just ask you for a closing statement before we give the broadcast info and wrap up. Yeah, we're, we're really excited to start league play. And uh, man, we got a great league. We got some great coaches in this league. We got great identity. Uh, we got great cultures. Our league's gotten off to a really good start. You know, we've got we've got a, probably a handful of high major wins. Uh, we've got some really really good non-conference wins, and um, we got some teams playing really well. And um, you know, I think I think this is going to be for a fan. Uh, I think this is going to be a fun two months to really follow. I think you know you, you, you look at a lot of teams in this league, and really anybody can beat anybody on a given night. And um, I think it's going to come down. Just like all games, right? The harder playing team that brings the most energy and plays the most connected usually is going to win. And um, I think it's going to be a fun two months. And so we're excited to get started. Um, you know, league league didn't didn't do us any favors, I guess. Threw us on the road twice. But I told the team this morning that was a huge part of our success last year. You know, we went and got some big wins on the road in league, and um, that allowed us, you know, to win the league. And, and so we we've got to we've got to be able to get off to a great start on the road and uh, we know we got a big challenge in front of us you know Greensboro especially with Brown Jones um, when you look at I, mean, I think they only lost one game when he was healthy and um, you know obviously he's been out the last couple games which has impacted them but they still have really good players if he plays or if he doesn't play and they're gonna be at home and they're gonna be excited to play I think it's gonna be a heck of a ball game and um, I've been really pleased with our guys response I've been really pleased with our attitude in practice All right, Coach, thank you. Just a reminder that uh, tomorrow night's game and the Saturday game at Chattanooga are both 7 o'clock starts. From a radio standpoint, that's airtime at 6.30 via the Fan Upstate, both on ESPN Plus, and the Saturday game is also the next start game of the week between the Paladins and Chattanooga. Thank you for tuning in to uh, Inside Furman Basketball with Head Coach Bob Ritchie. For all of us here at Fern, I'm Dan Scott. Say God bless you so long, everybody. This has been a Jeff Schetzel production.